Hi, it's time for another math easy solution. Time to discuss further two applications of integrals and now look at uh, application to economics and look at consumer surplus. Basically, there are many applications of integrals to economics and one of those applications is consumer surplus and I'll go over uh, the definition derivation in this video. Basically, a recall from my earlier video on marginal costs uh, versus marginal revenue that I showed that the demand function P of X is the price that a company has to charge in order to sell X units, X number of units of um, a commodity such as um, yeah, such as computers, etc. Just, uh, just pretty much anything. And um, and you can see that video in the video link below in the description. So, um, so and also usually, uh, yes, going further. Usually, when you sell larger quantities of, uh, yeah, yeah, when you sell larger quantities, it requires lowering the prices. So, if you want to sell a million TVs, you're gonna obviously want them really cheap. If you don't want to sell so much, you're gonna, you could uh, increase the price, and no one's gonna buy. So, a demand function is a decreasing function. And again, for example, only the very rich would want to buy a Ferrari at two hundred thousand. But, but if suddenly a Ferrari is worth twenty thousand uh, dollars many more people will buy one well including me I'll go buy Ferrari so the graph of a typical demand function is called a uh, demand curve and uh, it's shown below I'll draw that out soon so if capital X is the amount of the commodity that is currently available then capital P equals P of uh, capital X is the current selling price so if we were to draw this out so a typical demand curve looks like this. This is X and this is in uh, units. So that's, those are the units and then little p right here. And again, this is price per unit that we're gonna, be, we're gonna set. So demand curve, it's gonna be a decreasing function because yeah, the higher the price, the less people buy. So it's gonna look something like this. Typical one looks something that looks like this, unless you're uh, Apple and the higher price of an iPhone, the more people buy for some reason. Anyways, uh, so this is cap at this point right here. This is let's say the capital X. That's your selling point. I know that that is the number of units you sell when you set the price over here at capital P. So at this point is capital X, capital P. This function is P equals to P of X, and this is the uh, demand curve like that. And now before getting into a uh, more formal definition of the consumer surplus, let's just get an idea of what I mean by that. So let's consider a simple case where a group of people value, I just corrected that. So let's say they value a product at $20, but it's actually selling for $10. This, uh, basically, this just means they value the product more than the price it currently is at. In other words, if the price was decreased to twenty dollars, they would still buy it. So these guys value uh, this product a lot. So if this group of uh, people buy five units at a price of ten dollars per unit, which is the selling price initially, to them they would be saving ten dollars per unit because they value it at twenty dollars per unit. You could think of a discount, etc. So you would still buy, but with a discount, uh, yeah, you'll just save money from what you were gonna pay. Thus to them, they would save a total because there's five units you're buying at $10 per unit. And then the difference is, well, they valued at $20, so 20 minus 10 is just, so they save $10 every time they buy one. That's five times 10 equals 50. And plotting this on the demand curve, what we get, so basically it will look like if you were to draw this on a demand curve with using a typical demand curve, again, like the one, uh, like the one above. So it looks something like this. So, if we if the asking price is here at ten dollars, and this is uh, just whatever this is capital X, yeah, this is the number of total sales we'll get uh, based on this price. So this is ten dollars, and let's say at the asking price, so this group of people will lie on the price. Well, they valued at twenty dollars. So let's draw that let's say over here so this one is the value they valued at twenty dollars they they would have paid over here at this point like that and what I'm gonna do is draw this across like that and let's say they bought five units I'll just, so this is just anywhere like that this is five units they bought 
So from here to here is about five units. This is just again number of units. And so now if we were to graph this out, uh, no, just just put a rectangle above like that. So um, what we can do here is so basically if we were to shade in this full uh, yeah this full rectangle like this. This this represents basically the total cost because this is twenty dollars per unit. Yeah, I'll draw that out. again. This is all per unit, so twenty dollars per unit, ten dollars per unit, like that. So the multiplication of this uh, this price per unit times by the number of units, we get the total cost. So this shaded above curve right here, since we're going all the way up to the twenty dollar mark, this is the cost willing to pay by these users uh, by the, this group of individuals that value it at twenty dollars so cost willing to pay equals to well the cost per uh, unit willing to pay is twenty dollars per unit multiplied by the number of units which is five units so this uh, units cancel we're just left with well hundred dollars so this set of individuals are willing to pay one hundred dollars for five units but since it doesn't cost twenty dollars per unit, it actually costs ten dollars per unit. The actual cost, I'll shade this in blue right here. This is the actual cost. So again, this is going to be the ten dollars per unit times by number of units, which is five units. Yeah, like that. We end up getting well. This is five times ten. So this is fifty dollars. So this is the actual cost right here. Yeah, so that's the actual cost. So basically when so then this top part would represent the savings. And I'll write that in green. So this is the savings like that. And again, this would just simply equal to cost willing to pay willing to pay minus the actual cost. And this would be just equals to well, 100 minus 50. 100 minus 50, and in this case, this works out to be 50. So these group of um, consumers, they would save $50 from what they were actually gonna, well, actually willing to pay. Yeah, and now this savings right here that I just showed above, this savings is actually uh, called the consumer surplus for this group of individuals. And now yeah, that was just a simple case. Now we could extend this definition to a more general integral, integral formulation for the overall consumer surplus or the overall savings of all the consumers. Again, now, now what we'll do is like always with uh, when we derive integrals, we divide interval, um, this is in this case zero to capital X or the number of units we expect to sell at the price we're setting it to in, um, in, in basically n sub intervals. So we're going to break that into n, I'll draw that in a bit. Each of equal length delta x equals to capital X divided by n. And we're going to let the sampling point xi star, which is the point that um, we draw each of the uh, subintervals. Again, learn more about this in my integration videos. We're going to just let this equal to xi be the right endpoint of the ith interval, subinterval. And again, if after the first xi minus one units were sold, a total of, of xi units had been available and the price per unit had been set at pxi, then the additional delta x could have been sold, but no more. And I'll, again, illustrate this further, but it's all similar to the above simple case. I'll illustrate these points above right here. So if we have this demand curve again like that, so at this point, this is going to be our capital X. Here is going to be, we're going to draw a line like that. This is our capital P, which is our price per unit. And again, at this point, this is the capital X and capital P, like that. <clears throat> so we're going to break this up into uh, sub-intervals. We'll go from, let's say, X1, X2, etc. Keep going until we get to, well, let's say XI is here. Keeps going like that. And over here, this one's XN. So the last point is XN. And here we'll call this XI minus 1. And again, the xi star is the point that connects to this uh, curve right here, which is p equals to p of x. 
and and in this case we're choosing it to be the right endpoint and this this point could be any point in inside this interval again this is delta x width so this and we're choosing the right endpoint so this is the, the sampling point or x i star is the point that touches this curve so since we're finding the surplus uh, consumer surplus it's just going to be any all the uh, points above this or all the sub intervals or rectangles above this line P exactly as the simple case uh, that I illustrated above so we're gonna have something that looks like that let's draw this further the last one is a straight line like that yeah, let's draw this a bit neater so we're gonna do this for every single part like that Actually, whoops this one goes like that draw this line across like that and this last one like this this is like that and like that again as far as this point zero and now to uh, basically to describe this part more in detail so if after the first xi minus one unit so that's let's say you sold up to here we're sold a total of xi units had been available so if the price was it was set at p of x i which is right here p of x i then going from here which is p of x i minus one then the additional delta x could have been sold but this is but no more because again this is based on if we we're just following this curve uh, exactly because if we increase the price from here uh, i mean if we decrease the price from here to here the farthest it will go is delta x like that that's based on our curve and for different cases, you have different uh, numbers for whatever demand curve. Yes. Yeah, so now the consumers who would have paid P of X I, since again all of these values here are higher than this this uh, original selling price like that. Everyone is basically valuing it at a uh, on the product. They're giving it a high value or higher than the price that it's selling for. And basically this just means they would have paid what it was worth to them so if so what each one of these represents pretty much a group of individuals that would only buy you know that are willing to pay whatever this uh, amount is but if they were going to pay less than what they thought it was worth so and so basically they're going to be willing to pay p dollars which is the selling price again they would save an amount similar to uh, basically the same idea uh, that i showed in this simple case but now what they're going to do is, so the savings will be again similar like before, price willing to pay, or I'll just go uh, cost willing to pay right here. Yeah, cost willing to pay, and again minus the uh, uh, actual cost. And in this case, the only difference is now the price is general, just as P of X I, and then times by the number of units, which is delta X, like that. Yeah, this is to buy this number of units, this delta X, we're gonna be willing to pay this full amount like this, all the way drag it down, and then minus the actual cost, which would be, well, if I draw it like this, which is just this rectangle, which is gonna be, capital P or the pr actual price times delta X and this one could be just uh, factor out the, the delta X we get P of X I minus P and this is going to be our delta X and again this part right here could be represented as the savings per unit of that group of individuals right here, like that and that could be this point right here that's our savings per unit like that and now considering a similar group of willing consumers for each of the sub intervals or basically different price points some value it at really high so they'll pay but but again very few people value any specific product really high and a lot of people value it would value it less so that's just basic economics and then adding the savings when we when we group when we find basically consider all the similar groups or just a bunch of similar groups and, and then summing them up we get the total savings as, let's write total savings. Yeah, for like x1, x2, x3, etc. So if we were to try to get all of these points, 
I mean all of these groups of individual savings we get a summation when we sum it up from i equals to 1 all the way to n, i equals n of summing up this whole thing. So from 1 x1 one, x2 one, x3 this will be p of x i minus capital P and then delta x and again yeah, this sum corresponds to the area enclosed by the rectangles in the above um, figure right here. So these are just the area of these rectangles and again as I showed in my earlier videos on integration and the derivation of integrals this is just a Riemann sum if we let n go to infinity when we take a limit so then this approaches the integral basically we're going to get from the integral from 0 to capital X of and then write this as again when you have infinitely small uh, intervals of delta X goes to infinitely small this XI coincides with XI minus 1 etc. This will just be P of X minus capital P DX. So this here is the consumer surplus, the overall consumer surplus. Yeah, and here basically economics uh, call this the consumer surplus for the commodity that is being sold. And the consumer surplus represents the amount of money saved by all the consumers in purchasing the com commodity at the current selling price P which corresponds to an amount demanded of X. Yeah, basically saying if you, have a, if you set a price, whatever price it is, you're going to have a different number of people demanding it, and then the overall savings based on every single consumer's different, um, yeah, based on the demand curve of the number of units that were going to be sold, or, yeah, or the overall savings of what people would be willing to pay to what the actual price is. So in this interpretation of a consumer surplus can be seen as the area under the demand curve and above the line P. So again, when we sum it up to infinity, you get, you get the integral, we don't, then the rectangles basically coincide into a, so just a smooth area. So if we have this is P, this one right here is P equals P of X. Then if this is the point like this, let's draw this across. And this is X, that's P, this is capital X, make it bigger than the small one. At this point is the X, P, then this line is P equals to P of X, which is equals to the capital P for selling price. And P of capital X, actually. Which equals to capital P. And then this area under this region is the total savings of all the consumers because it's above um, the yeah it's above the actual price right here and this is the consumer surplus when you look at it visually this is the definition that this is the visual representation of the definition we just showed above anyways that is all for today if you learn from this pretty interesting video on economics and the consumer surplus and like always, you can download these exact notes in the link below. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for another math easy solution.